Good morning. Um, as everyone here knows, uh, I'm Mary Sauer from the Attorney General's Office, and with me is Lauren Parker, also from the Attorney General's Office. And Lauren and I were asked to uh, prepare a memo, which we did um, several weeks back, and I think it was handed out at a uh, in the uh, mid-September uh, board meeting. And the memo has to do with the extent of DEP's rulemaking authority regarding mining on state lands. And uh, feel free, please, to interrupt me. I'm just going to do a very, very brief summary of our memo, but interrupt us, and we're happy to uh, answer questions. And we will, we're here to talk about the kind of legal aspect of the department's authority. If you have more specific questions about the mining on public lands section, uh, it, I may end up turning those over to Jeff. So we'll see how it goes. Uh, Title 12 of Maine's statutes contain a subchapter called Mining on State Lands that was enacted in 1985, and Cindy gave that subchapter out earlier this morning, so you have it in that group of uh, papers. Uh, that subchapter gives jurisdiction over mining on state lands to a division of the uh, Department of Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry, specifically the Division of Geology, Natural Areas, and Coastal Resources. And also, sec also it gives jurisdiction to whichever agency has jurisdiction over that land. And we'll probably just say the, the, the agency that owns the land. But really, typically, that will be ACF, Ag Conservation and Forestry, um, through parks and lands. Um, but it also might be uh, inland fisheries and wildlife as well. And the Mining on State Lands subchapter has a number of provisions. I think the most important ones being to allowing the agency to issue exploration permits for mining on state lands. And then very significantly, to uh, gives the agency, actually requires the agency to issue a land use consistency ruling. And that land use consistency ruling is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. It's a ruling that uh, the using it for, using that public land for mining is basically consistent with the current and I believe any proposed uses uh, of that public land. And before the agency can make that land use consistency ruling, it has to hold a public hearing. Assuming the answer is in the affirmative, uh, the, uh, that the land use, the proposed land use for mining is consistent, then the agency has the authority to issue a mining lease. And I think, as you heard from Bob Marvini uh, during the public comments, um, uh, the agency has done that in just, a, I think, a couple of cases in the last few decades. Not necessarily for, for mineral, metallic mineral mining. If the state land at issue, oh, I should also say, before the agency can issue a mining lease, it also must hold a public hearing at that step as well. If the state land at issue is quote unquote designated land, which I think you've heard about, uh, designate lands. Then there are additional provisions of Maine statute, which I think in Title 12, which Cindy attached right at the end of the subchapter. Um, I think it's clipped to the end there. And that ref and those additional provisions reflect the Maine constitutional requirement uh, that was enact uh, was adopted uh, in early 1990, early to mid 1990s, I believe. And Basically, the Constitution and the corresponding statute say that designated lands may not be reduced or substantially altered except by a two-thirds vote of the main legislature. And substantially altered means changed so as to significantly alter the physical characteristics in a way that frustrates the essential purposes for which that land is held by the state. Therefore, an agency cannot allow mining on designated lands if mining would frustrate the essential purposes of that state-owned land unless it's given over to the legislature and the legislature has an affirmative two-thirds vote. Uh, designated lands include a whole slew of different kinds of lands, and I think the statute describing or defining designated lands is also uh, in the packet that Cindy gave to you. 
the mining law that was enacted by the legislature in 2012 did not mention state-owned lands. It made no changes to the mining on state land subchapter in Title 12 that I've just been talking about, even though it did make other changes to, 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 to Title 12 having to do with the uh, jurisdiction of the uh, LUPC versus DEP to issue mining permits. And mining on state lands is not specifically mentioned, not mentioned at all um, in the rulemaking authority provided to the department. Uh, generally, the words of a statute are the best indicator of legislative intent, which I'm sure the former legislators on the board will appreciate that. And the absence of any mention of state-owned lands in the mining law does, to us, show a lack of legislative intent for the board to enact broad uh, prohibitions on mining in categories of state-owned lands. And given the absence of legislative intent, we provided the advice in our memo that we don't believe that the board has a legal authority to enact or to adopt categorical bans on mining of state lands. However, as you've also heard, I think, in, in public comment, the mining on state land subchapter does make clear that environmental rules do apply to mining on state lands. It's the very last section of the subchapter that Cindy handed out to you. Uh, it says, nothing in the subchapter may be deemed to relieve any explorer or mining lessee from the obligation to comply with all applicable environmental or other regulatory laws and rules of the state. So in the event a state agency does issue an affirmative land use consistency ruling, I'm making an assumption here that it's not teed up for the legislature for a two-thirds vote. But if they did issue an affirmative land use consistency ruling, where it was teed up for the legislature and the legislature voted and you know, had, had the two-thirds vote in the affirmative and it went back to the agency for the land use consistency ruling and then the agency granted a mining lease, the lessee still would be required to apply for a mining permit under Chapter 200 and comply with all the provisions in Chapter 200 and uh, that they would also have to comply with all other applicable DEP environmental statutes and rules such as you've been hearing about today you know, with um, air and water and the Natural Resources Protection Act, except in a couple cases where the 2012 mining law has made certain laws, such as the site location development law, no longer applicable to uh, mining. But we're happy to, really that's what we, we were asked to, to come and sit at the table today, is really just to talk about the board's, board's legal authority. This is something that when the rule was uh, proposed uh, a couple of years ago and provisionally adopted by the board. Certainly, um, we had, I, I had some concerns back then, but we had some different language in the rule, which actually was very confusing. And uh, when the rule went to the legislature, there was a lot of discussion in front of the Environmental and Natural Resources Committee about mining and state lands, and I don't think, uh, the ENR committee ever came to a firm conclusion. <laughs> I think everyone understood that there was a lot of uncertainty because the 2012 mining law simply does not does not address the issue. But we're happy to answer questions. So indirectly, it doesn't address it because there are some rules out there that have to be met before and after them to show right title or interest to the state. And without showing right title of interest to the state, they can't file for a permit to do any mining. Exactly. And they can't get that right title of interest either without an action of the state, or in most cases probably would be the legislature. Yeah. And if that the legislature right. then chose to grant it, they've got right title of interest, now they jump into the process that we're talking about. Exactly, and we talked with Jeff about that. So that I, think the state, I don't think the legislature was remiss in not doing it. I don't think it was necessary to do the way the rules were already set up because there's a, there's a lot of hurdles to jump before you could ever even come after a chapter 200. Yes, and we agree that it really is a title right and interest issue. So if someone came to Mark or Jeff with a mining application and they noticed that it was on state lands, the very first question would be, oh, have you gone through everything you have to do Right. In Title 12, and they wouldn't even get in the door at DEP until they. Until that, they wouldn't even accept the application. So. Correct. So, in addition to all of that, that was really very useful. Thank you. 
um, words of meaning. And we typically talk about uh, mining on certain <coughs> lands. Now, although I'm looking at the rules here with regard to in, on, or under, the word under it, it, it goes in here, but the question here, does the state own the right mineral rights to the center of the earth? Where are the legal aspects of that? To help us out with that. I think, so, you know, if the state own, like, owns land, it has a deed. Um, and if it has a deed that purports to the state fee simple title, then we would assume, uh, without anything to the contrary, that it owns the subsurface. So unless those mineral rights have been severed somewhere along the chain of title, um, we would say that, yes, the state owns the subsurface, which would include mineral rights. Good. I hope, I hope that's in there somewhere because I know, and, and uh, I don't know enough about the uh, all of the states' uh, mineral rights situations because some people don't own it to the center of the earth. They just own what they have on the surface, and maybe some reasonable depth. I don't know, but um, I'm just looking the way we have it said here, and I was hoping that we could change some of the words and just to, instead of, and I'll just say it here. We'll spoke over for a second. Of stuff in it. So, uh, removal of ore in, on, or under great ponds, rivers, brooks, and streams, and coastal wetlands is defined in 38 MRS uh, 480B, etc. Mining is prohibited. Well, I would like to see that changed simply to uh, mining prohibited if should it stay in that condition uh, for removal of ore in or on. Uh, Great ponds, rivers, brooks. In other words, you don't want to be in the rivers uh, or in the ponds or in the lakes or in the wetlands digging stuff up in them, which is effectively on them as well. But under them is a totally different world. And, um, and that, that goes on down to uh, number four, where they're talking about surface mining shall not be allowed within one mile and underground mining within a quarter of a mile. And that's, that's something that caught my eye because why? because a quarter of a mile underground away from a, a border with a park, a state park or the Open National Wildlife Refuge or Wilderness Area or state lands or whatever, uh, underground, uh, there are no topographical features up, uh, up above ground that uh, tend to affect how you would write it. And in fact, it's mentioned down here about topographical features, because I like this a lot unless the applicant can demonstrate to the satisfaction of the department that there are topographical features that provide sufficient protection of the resource. Try and protect the resource in a number of different ways. Don't want too many, you don't want, uh, in many cases, you don't want the, the viewscape uh, of, of a, a mine on the surface of the ground within a certain distance uh, to uh, a state line. And, that, and here it would be a mine. But on the other hand, should there be a, a large topographical feature in the way so that you could actually be a lot closer to that boundary, uh, those people within the state property or whatever it is would not even know that necessarily that a mining is going on. Well, writ large, that's what underground mining means at all. The underground entrance could be miles, many miles away from the boundary, and that's the entrance. And then all of the mine, underground mining activity is not visible under normal means by on the surface with topographic features other than perhaps they've got to have, uh, they have to be able to control their own air underground and therefore you will find in certain places uh, vent shafts for just air in and out. Uh, and those things of course maybe they shouldn't be within, I don't know. What I'm saying here is that, uh, that uh, under is, I don't think under belongs up there, although as you say, the minimum belong to the state, that's the way it is in this case. Um, if the mineral, if, the, if I'm not even sure what that means because what if you say to Ball Mountain, which is very large, uh, for example, for a very large piece of real estate, um, tens of miles by tens of miles, by significant depth, so how deep? And um, and of course, that's a piece of public, uh, pardon me, privately owned land, as opposed to a public location. I just don't know how this is going to fit in both of those. 
But I think we really need to know that underground mining, in most cases, when it's done properly, is uh, safe and virtually does not affect topographical characteristics. And so I just want to, I'll put in that, I don't know if this is a place to put it, but I would like to see that one sentence in both of those paragraphs to be so allowed in or on and scratch to the name under would make it a lot better for me. Well, I think you make some, some pretty good points. Uh, you know, certainly in the the prohibition in, on, or under Great Ponds, Rivers, Brooks, and Streams, uh, I think originally, a couple years ago, we had from, and in fact, uh, a little bit of a typo there, I never struck it out. Uh, so we have under from. <laughs> uh, could use a little bit of wordsmithing there. Uh, I don't know that, you know, in, in thinking about it, you know, in, on, or from, and I'm not sure that even including from in there would, would really provides anything additional. It's in or on. Uh, you know, when we originally drafted this, it was based on the Natural Resources Protection Act, which I believe is in, on, or adjacent to. So I think from the standpoint of protection from a resource, uh, being concerned with uh, preventing a, a, a direct or indirect discharge to water body, I think in or on is probably sufficient to uh, be fully protective of those resources, recognizing that if an applicant were to come in and propose mining underneath this, they would have to conclusively demonstrate that they aren't going to affect that water body, and that's the key. Uh, they, they still couldn't uh, or and wouldn't be allowed to uh, drain, the, drain the lake, if you will. Uh, because that's going to violate any number of the water quality standards, uh, you know, Cindy handed out to you previously, surface water quality standards for rivers and also lakes. So uh, certainly something we can consider. That's very well stated. Because that's virtually what we're looking for. Because any distance uh, and proximity to a boundary underground is pays no relationship at all to what the geology is there and what the underground mining will be like. You're looking at stratiform sedimentary rocks, you're looking at igneous and metamorphic rocks, and in certain situations, you probably, as a miner, a mining engineer, you wouldn't want to go any closer than X, but I don't know what the value of X is. So uh, if you can just take, yeah, you've done it right there, Jeff, I think. And in both those cases. Yeah, I guess I would add that, you know, there was, there was considerable public concern from any number of stakeholders over this issue, both, both in our prior rulemaking and at the legislature. Uh, would, you, would you suggest that perhaps we include something that the, you know, the applicant must, and I'm just making this up as we go, conclusively demonstrate that there will not be an impact to the resource or something like that, just to, just to provide a little more sure. certainty, a guarantee for, for the public and the resource. Not all underground activities are free of faults. Sure. And so, and I don't mean just faults in the geological sense, but free from problems. It's just the example, I've got a few here that just off of a Google thing, and I'll, I'll go back to the ones that I wanted to read carefully. Um, say no to copper mining in the headwaters of Montana's Smith River. It's not a very big document, interesting one. And there's also some suggestions here, uh, not only venturing into a surreal salt mine 2,000 feet below Lake Erie, which they are doing, there's also Cargill stops mining salt under Lake Erie out of safety concerns. So there are safety concerns anytime you're mining anywhere, and you need to fully understand uh, the engineering characteristics of the rock, the, the media underneath the surface. And so that's very well put, basically saying you've got to convince the board that what you propose takes you like, say, uh, less than a, a quarter of a mile, maybe even a tenth of a mile away, but that's where you need to get into the, to the bread, to the, the sweet spot of the, of the uh, ore body without causing any damage to the land under consideration. 
Along well, that line, I think uh, what he's getting at by the wording may be appropriate. Because if, if you don't, if you say a quarter mile or a mile, basically you're taking the rights away from landowners who do not, who just because they're adjacent to a uh, piece of state land. What you want to do is you want to protect the views, the resource, all that. If, and if you do that, then the landowners outside of that parcel land should maintain their rights to do whatever is permitted if they can meet all those conditions. But you also could shut them down if they affect it aesthetically, if they affect it groundwater-wise. There's a lot of issues that you could deal with. So I think your word in that, Jeff, may be, may be the way to do it. Yeah, I think to that end, uh, I'd also like to point out, and we don't have it in our draft. Uh, we didn't have it in our previous drafts. But the, the mining framework law does allow us to, in fact, it's one of the citing criteria that the development uh, harmoniously fit in with, and it lists a number of, of different parameters, uh, scenic uses, unusual natural areas. Uh, and if you were to look at our chapter 375, I believe it is, our Site Location of Development Act rules, our standards, there are provisions in there for things such as uh, unusual natural areas, scenic resources, uh, historic sites, uh, fisheries and wildlife uh, protection. Uh, it's fairly uh, performance-based. It is not very prescriptive, but those, in fact, uh, have been in place for some time. Uh, that is a major substantive rule that the legislature did, in fact, have to prove. And if you look at the terminology within the framework law, uh, these are the same terms. I mean, clearly, the legislature anticipated and recognize that those provisions are in the site law. Uh, one thing I, I had thought was uh, we could add those in to the standard section, perhaps at the end. It's not really a citing issue. It is a standard. But it, it would give the, the department uh, one additional very clear mechanism to address unreasonable impacts for scenic, impa uh, scenic uh, resources unusual natural areas, historic sites, and, and the like. Uh, so I'm just, I'm just proposing that to the board for, some, for, for your consideration. I actually like comment question similar to yours, uh, Jeff. You know, first of all, thank you, Mary. That was helpful in defining that not all public lands are created equal, and there's procedures for determining <clears throat> whether or not it's appropriate to mine on public lands or not. I feel a little bit better in the fact that there are processes in place that, that can't be done arbitrarily. My question was going to be, and, and Melanie just had it on the screen a few minutes ago, is how does that then relate to the setback issue of, you know, the authority to, if, 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 the, if and how does that relate to that particular um, language, if you could pull that back, uh, Melanie, because it talks about or if unless some other agency, I, I didn't really understand how that language works in, in relation to what you just explained to us. Yeah, actually, I, I can talk, talk about that. Uh, the unless some other agency clause, if you will, it was the department's efforts to, to recognize that these resources did deserve some protection and some consideration. But at the same time, we recognize we don't have control over these resources per se. Again, they, uh, many of them are in fact state lands. Some of them are federal lands. And if the uh, relevant agency, for example, agriculture, forestry, or conservation, or, or federal land uh, manager, were to permit mining on that, uh, it's, it, you, you then end up with a nonsensical result that we'd be saying, no, you can't mine within a quarter mile or a mile. Oh, but you can mine on it. So this is a, it, it's an effort to recognize that we have only limited authority to address some of the scenic and aesthetic and, and uh, cultural issues, if you will, for those, for those specific sites.
I think 